everybody and welcome to this All You Need Is A Ball webinar where today I am joined by my good friend Drew. Um, hello Drew, how are you doing today? It's going great, thank you Dan. Good, good. So Drew is one of the uh, co-founders of Love Football, an amazing NGO um, established for a few reasons but I'm not going to ruin that, that part of it. I'm going to let, let Drew tell that story himself. Um, and the, the object of today's session is to uncover another story, another inspiration behind how football can be used as a tool for social impact and development. Um, and of course, proving that again, all you need is a ball um, to, to start a, an initiative or yeah, move forward in your career within the industry in, in some way. So again, thank you for joining me today, Drew. Um, I've, been lucky enough to hear your story a few times and, and see some of your work in action. Um, but yeah, you've got some pretty exciting things on the horizon, I know as well. So yeah, so what, what, what's going on in your world? Maybe you can start by telling, uh, telling everyone where you are and, uh, and, and where it all began for you. Sounds great, Dan. Thank you for having me, man. It's uh, great to connect. Our paths have been crossing for some years and uh, super impressed with everything you've done. And, and uh, uh, I, I happen to be uh, a soccer guy through and through. I, I spent, uh, you know, since before I could walk, uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C. I live in Brooklyn nowadays, which is a bit of a hot spot, as, as you know, um, yeah. around, uh, you know, issues in our country, critical issues. And, and so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a sad and inspirational time uh, right now in Brooklyn. Um, so I'm just trying to you know, listen and learn and, and hopefully, uh, you know, contribute in the, in the small ways that I can to more social justice. And we hope that Love Football is, stands for some of those ideals inherently. And I'll tell you more about that. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, going back to, you know, me growing up, I, I, I uh, was, you know, before I could walk, I had a ball at my feet, um, you know, just loved and gravitated towards the game you know I was that kid you know uh juggling in you know backyard for hours every day and and uh you know so i i just you know had a had a real relationship with the ball and, and so i love what what you stand for and you have brought together a world of you know freestylers uh you know that had that same uh you know kind of inherent uh, attraction to the to the ball um <laughs> But uh, to go to the, the story of Love Football, um, you know, kind of part two of, you know, having this, uh, 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 you know, love for the game was that I grew up traveling around the world. I had uh, parents that were explorers and uh, loved to see, uh, you know, you know, all types of you know wild cultures and and like really dig in and and, and travel more than just being a tourist they were like active and right right and uh so i i'd been to six continents by the time i was 12 and in all these wow. places you know the kids were playing the game that i loved too and uh so i had this ability to like not just be a passive bystander but to connect with kids play with kids and kind of see into their eyes and see how much we had you know that we were fundamentally the same um, even though, uh, you know, I, I was, I was on a fortunate side, you know, I was, I had the, the fortune to be able to travel at a young age and, um, and, you know, a lot of the kids I was seeing, you know, didn't have that type of opportunity. Um, but, you know, again, through this shared passion, we, we were, um, on the same level fundamentally. And so that, that was kind of like the, the whole, like, you know, formative years, uh, for me and, and really shaped what ended up you know, contributing to the beginning of low football, which is that uh, I was studying abroad in Barcelona in 2005. Um, I, I traveled down into Morocco uh, it, for 10 days. It was, I was on my own and just kind of exploring, seeing seeing that the country. And, you know, it was amazing. Like, you know, at the right hour of the day, you know, kids were playing soccer on every street corner, you know, when it was just going, you know, sun starting to cool off a little bit. And, you know, uh, just soccer obsessed nation and you know i always i would always wear you know i think it was sambas at the time like just ready to play and i was like on pickup <laughs> you know, yeah one corner in the next and uh yeah so it was it was it was, it was beautiful and um it's it's a it's a bit of a story so I'll, I'll go a little bit fast through it but 
you know, I ended up serendipitously in this town that I still don't know the name of, and uh, in, was actually in an alleyway uh, that, you know, they have these kind of beautiful, like very narrow alleys, and I was kind of exploring, and I came across this, this opening in the alleyway, and there was about you know, maybe eight kids playing uh, this just, you know, pickup game uh, in the small, you know, maybe, you know, three by eight meters, you know, space and, right. and running, uh, no, no one's older than the age of 10. And they're running around and, and there's this canal that like, kind of was like almost a foot across and like almost a foot deep, but like hard cement corners. And um, these kids are like jumping back and forth over it, chipping the ball, like, you know, having a blast, like big smiles on their faces, um, you know, doing it without even looking like at, clearly they grew yeah. up there is like, you know, just part of the game. And just like, it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, was, I was 23 at the time. And I, you know, as I mentioned, I had grown up seeing the game and, and like kind of these grassroots era areas and, and like I had a deep belief in in the beauty of the game on the grassroots level and like in that perfection and the fact that like you know kids play in uh you know in these imperfect circumstances all the time and these imperfect places but like that they actually serve perfectly and like they they still hold the great power of, of football and and uh you know to create hope and you know inspiration in people's lives in you know very simple but critical ways and uh but this moment in morocco it, it crossed some line from this kind of like beautiful imperfection of the game uh, to like actually like these kids playing in like some degree of like real danger. Like it wasn't the craziest scene, but like, you know, they, it, you know, you could fall hard in that canal and, and it, and like, it just somehow like fundamentally like crossed the line. And like, you know, that I, I was like, it, and born a really a question, which was, you know, do kids face challenges to playing soccer, like the world's most simple game, um, which is an idea that I had never thought of before, uh, you know, that kids might not have access to places to play. Um, and, and, and this game that had given me so much throughout my life and I felt fundamentally grateful for, you know, the, the idea that kids might not have a safe place for soccer uh, seemed fundamentally wrong. You know, it's, uh, yeah. and like that, that was the premise of what became La Football. Um, and uh, I'll stop there, but I can, you know, that's when we... No, absolutely. <laughs> <you know, we're laughs> Stories story galore, which is what we love. Um, but that's really interesting. And, and, and it's great to hear that, you know, A, you've had those experiences in so many countries. I'm, I can only imagine, you know, I've traveled a fair bit myself, but by the age of 12 to have seen yeah. <laughs> the places you have, that, that's phenomenal. And, and for Morocco to have... A state that's really um, nice to hear. Morocco's got such rich football culture, as you say, um, uh, but it doesn't always have the infrastructure or the the programs on the ground as well. So we should definitely shout out to Morocco and give them some credit in here. I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what about so you you then uh, you went back to the to the US, I guess, after this this stint of time, and and what what did you do next? Did you work in any conventional job first before you sort of started this idea, or how, how did your career pan out? Well, I, I was still an undergrad, and I, I I became like kind of obsessed with that question, you know, like to kids face challenges playing soccer, and I I had a semester left of school, which I started to weave that question, and I started reading about social enterprise, and I got really kind of inspired about all that type of thing, and um, I actually spoke with that. I did go back to the U.S. right after that and, and spoke with uh, uh, a teammate of mine from college, Dickinson College, um, where, we, where we played together soccer and uh, about this idea. And, um, you know, the short version of the story is that we decided to, like, do something about it and, you know, you know, explore first of all this question, you know, do kids face challenges playing soccer? And we both had some, some connections to Guatemala and uh, felt like we wanted to be in a, you know, soccer passionate part of the world uh, where, uh, you know, there was, you know, profound poverty and, uh, you know, it wasn't an overly scientific analysis, but we, you know, we ended up in, in Guatemala exploring that question that was, you know, created in out of a, mo a moment in Morocco. Like we didn't really know mm -hmm. if we were on anything. And uh, at, this was right after I graduated. We 
uh, you know, spent three weeks in Guatemala and like, uh, you know, we kind of like knocked on every door. We ended up forming some partnerships, low level partnerships with the Department of Physical Education in the country. And they helped take us around the country and see, you know, schools, you know, that we could only get to by boat and by motorcycle and, uh, you know, indigenous communities in the middle, you know, on the tops of mountains. And, yeah. you know, it was, it was really an incredible experience. Um, but the big thing that we came out of that with was that kids face wide variety of challenges to playing soccer. I mean, everything from like kids playing barefoot in trash dumps with, you know, broken glass and metal shards to, you know, the it's often romanticized and, and, you know, most times is, is totally safe, but kids playing in the street. Um, but, you know, a lot of times it's not, you know, like, you know, we were in communities where kids got hit by cars and tuk-tuks, um, you know, uh, playing soccer in the street, you know, kids who had to walk along highways and, you know, for miles and, and cross major highways in order to go play. And then even, crazy stories like uh one community where kids had to cross a one lane train track bridge um to go play on this land that was owned by a drug trafficker and they would only play there and they had prohibited kids from going there they would only play there in the middle of the night when there was enough moonlight uh wow. you know clandestine soccer and <laughs> so i mean you know these crazy stories and, and you know, what it did is it just inspired us in such a big way to like, yes, like kids do face challenges to the, the world's most simple game. And, and like, you know, how can we, um, you know, potentially bring this, this challenge um, uh, to, uh, you know, our community and, and, you know, say like, can we create safe spaces to play? You know, what, what, what can that look like? And, so that was kind of like the, the awesome. second big step. <laughs> so, so that's good. So we've got the trigger. We've got the kind of inspiration. We've got the, the, the next stage of getting it going. Who was, if you were to credit any, I don't know if there was any one organization or maybe a couple that came together, but who were the first ones to believe in your concept and your, and your dream here to do something about it? Well, um, you know, as I mentioned, we had the, the Department of Physical Education in Guatemala, which ended up yeah. being our first big partner. Um, but, you know, critically, like we came, you know, this, this, this experience in Guatemala, like gave us a lot of energy and, and we went back to our community in the U.S. and in New York and Philly, uh, sorry, New York, D.C. and, and uh, Connecticut, we, you know, these were pre-Kickstarter pre days and raised money and, and you know, our our friends, our family, our, our community supported us uh, to kind of launch this idea. We raised, I think, I think it was $30,000, which was, you know, a good amount of money and, and uh, returned to Guatemala. And, um, you know, we had identi identified some, some pilot communities. Um, and, and like, this is actually, you know, when you say like, you know, who's, who believed in us, um, you know, the most important was the communities themselves. Um, you know, we, we went to this, our first community is called Villa Nueva. It's a, a, a village of 55 families in the far west of Guatemala um, in the department of San Marcos. And, um, you know, we said to the community, like, you know, look, like we, we, you know, we have some resources we can bring. We noticed that kids don't have a safe place to play. We, had, we, we held a community meeting and um, we said, you know, the most important thing that we said is like, we didn't want to impose on anyone. Like we wanted this to be a partnership. And, and we said to the community, you know, we cannot do this without you. And, and we meant it. And like, you know, we, we can bring these resources, but we frankly didn't, didn't know a ton. I mean, we'd done some research, but we didn't have background in construction and, and, you know, uh, had built a pitch before or anything like that. <clears throat> and, you know, the amazing thing is that, uh, you know, the, the community expressed, in, you know, they had questions, they were skeptical, um, but they ultimately, like, we came to an agreement to, like, work on this together. And, you know, the community, these communities, like, work, work hard, you know, like, at least the men, in the men and women, but the men in the communities, you know, they, they leave at, like, four or five in the morning, they walk to the fields, work all day in the sun, you know, come back when it's dark again, they do that six out of seven days a week. And on our first Sunday in, in the community, uh, at 6 a.m., 
we had 45 of 55 heads of households show up and work the entire day to, you know, uh, physically begin the, the construction of this space. And what I, what I kind of love most about the, the story is that, you know, Alfredo, the co-founder and I, like, you know, we went from being like kind of the pseudo catalysts and leaders of this project to immediately the least valuable, you know, yeah. people in the community because, you know, they had built their own homes and uh, with their own hands and, and had the inherent skills, had the energy, had the organizational capacity to, to really drive this project. And that's exactly what they did. That was the first step. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we were partners, but uh, the community completely led what ended up becoming our, our very first project, uh, which we inaugurated in August 2007. Love it. And, and I can really, you know, that, that really resonates with me in so many ways in terms of, I think, the, the attitude that you have, I think, and the, the, the belief in the whole model, because you're, you're essentially enabling, right, the, the, whole, the whole purpose and also sort of certainly my interpretation anyway, and where I love seeing the work you do is there's many people that can go out and build a pitch and they can go into anywhere and they, they'll rock up and put some amazing facilities in and they'll, they'll make it look all great and lovely brands everywhere and, and it all looks very wonderful. Um, but then there's a massive difference between doing that as we can actually go back to the 2010 World Cup in Africa to, to give some very good examples of how not to do it, let's say, in, in many cases of just building facilities and then leaving them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, really it's about engaging that community is, is probably the biggest USP that you've got, isn't it? Is, is how you build that bond. That, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, our, our hashtag is, is more than a place to play. And, you know, we exist to ensure kids have a safe place to play, but the way that we accomplish that through this community driven methodology, um, which is what we ended up, you know, really developing as our expertise over the course of nine projects in Guatemala, which was like our first era. And now we've done 47 projects, uh, you know, on five continents um, mm. is, uh, you know, what it really, as you said, you know, kind of distinguishes is our how, you know, our, our average project has over 2,500 hours of volunteer community service, um, you know, by hundreds of local community members. And so, you know, it really is, uh, you know, it's about like, how do you build a deep emotional connection between a community and a space? You know, when you talk about the sector of development through football, you know, social development through football or football for good, um, you know, how do you begin with a precedent of community driven development, right? You know, how do you like, yeah. the ideals and the power of, of soccer is uh, something that can exist in any community. So how do you begin with that, creating that place, that very platform, like physically, and also kind of like spiritually and psychologically as like, you know, this is a, a symbol of our strength together. This is a, a platform for social change. You have the opportunity to talk with the community about the potential, the great potential of a sports space, um, to be a, you know, a platform to address what are the so the unique social challenges of any given community um, or to be a social enterprise that can be self-sustaining and, and like, how do you build a maintenance plan, a sustainability plan that's tailored to the unique reality where only locals are the best to answer, you know, a lot of these questions of, yeah. you know, how, how, how can we generate revenue or, you know, raise money collectively and maintain this as a, you know, transparent social collective asset. Um, and that's what we help communities do. Awesome. So um, some of the, some of the, actually let's start with the challenges. So uh, obviously it's never going to be completely rosy and, and easy along the way um, being an NGO for one, but, but to, um, you know, just in general, just, just, just growth pains and, um, and challenges along the way, anything that stands out as like horrific experiences that, that you wouldn't mind sharing with us or the things that you had to really overcome. Oof, boy, <laughs> where do I begin? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it, becoming a viable financial entity took a long time. Uh, you know, we grew this out of being, you know, completely idealistic and 
not really prioritizing a, a financial model in our earliest days. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend our, our pathway, um, but, uh, you know, we wanted to prove that we could do what we said we could do. And that gave us kind of the confidence and the, and the credibility on some level to then like build relationships with groups that could more, that could really invest in this. And, and what happened for us is that we, um, you know, had built this know-how over the course of, you know, nine and then projects we, we began in uh, a story in Brazil after Guatemala, uh, which is where we've been most active and where most of our team is based. Um, and this was leading up to the 2014 World Cup. And we started bringing on corporate sponsors. And uh, our first sponsor was Coca-Cola. Um, and it led from, it began with a, a small relationship in with a bottler in the Northeast to a relationship with Coca-Cola Global, where they want to do projects around the world. And, um, you know, uh, what happened is we ended up realizing that there's a way that we can and you know again here comes the theme of social enterprise is you know align um you know the value that you can create for a company with our social mission and you know us to stay true to ourselves but at the same time create you know real strategic value for a company and and we've done that with uh, a lot of sponsors um, and, and, and really the greatest brands. I mean, ESPN is, has been our biggest sponsor of the last years and obviously is, is deep in, in sport and is a global brand. And uh, Manchester City, we've done projects, UEFA, um, uh, Under Armour, uh, you know, and we've worked with a number of other brands. And so getting to that point um, took a long time and uh you know but what it then began was an era of some you know financial viability um today we're kind of in a new era of financial uh questions you know like how do, how do we diversify our revenue streams or away from just you know corporate funding and um and actually get back to our roots um which is you know what our our brand really means which is that we're engaging a global soccer passionate community um, that are tied through this game to uh to ensure the right to play to ensure the game yeah. you know like that's it's what a tricky balance isn't it it's, it's such a tricky balance because i'm and, and again that re i'm really happy to hear that because i think that more um ngos in general but especially in, in this space have to think more like a business from an earlier stage in order to to unlock those other opportunities that are certainly funding based but there's that risk it's that that um, equilibrium risk of you know how much do you want to go away from your core um, values as you said or your your beliefs in one le level um, but then you have to always adapt to their missions as well and their their campaigns and there is a way there is always a way but um, I don't think anyone will ever get it perfectly right at, at, at all, at all yeah. time. <laughs> Um, Absolutely right, so, what, so, like you said, you picked out some of the, the highlights there as well, which was going to be um, my next my next question. But I think the website so for anyone watching, I'll post the links below. Certainly, please do check out the the projects that you built so far. Um, there's some some pretty amazing places, and we'll be recommending to to freestylers and street footballers as well to go and check out these these courts and and pitches and everywhere in the world. Um, and and hopefully we can collaborate at some point as well um what about coming up so you said so you're, you're rethinking a bit at the moment obviously it's a world crisis there's differences in everyone's way of working um you've got the world cup coming to the u.s on, on home soil soon so that must obviously have some something on the horizon for you i'm sure but anything to look forward to in particular that you can reveal is there any any exciting development well, we're in an interesting moment for a lot of reasons. And, you know, with COVID, uh, you know, we, we had a, a tough, a tough experience. So we, we, we had to uh, let go of, uh, you know, almost half of our team, which was a really, uh, you know, traumatic in, in some ways uh, mm -hmm. thing to go through. We've never gone through anything like that. And, and, you know, we have a close team and a culture and uh, you know, a lot of momentum collectively and, that was really difficult, um, you know, to talk about challenges. Um, yeah. 
uh, and, and that was coming off of last year, which was our best year ever. We did 11 projects in, in nine different countries and like 2020 was, you know, slated to be even bigger. And, um, but, um, you know, we've got this unusual gift of time in the context of COVID and, you know, we're not able to do new projects and, and with funders, we've been working with, uh, it's called the Pincus Family Foundation, which funded five projects in three countries over the last couple of years. And they've been an incredible partner and um, they're actually investing in our ability to, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a conversation about scale. And, you know, for the first time, you know, we've been in this grind for years, like, but for the first time, we're really able to like take a step back and say like, how can we do this better? You know, how can we do this bigger and better? And um, so we're in that conversation right now, which is really exciting. And, um, uh, you know, just to give you an example, um, and, and to, to the point you were helping me make, which is, you know, about getting back to like core values. Um, you know, last year we had a, a 17 year old named Jordan Pelube, um, who, uh, was born in, in Arusha, Tanzania. And he was uh, actually adopted by a family in Tampa, Florida, uh, and, um, you know, is a soccer player through and through and wanted to give back to the community that he was from originally. And he raised over $120,000 to uh, build a pitch in his home community, uh, wow. which, we, which we did last year together. Um, he's an incredibly inspirational individual. And, you know, he has a unique story, um, but there are people throughout the world that want to give back to the game, you know, that feel grateful to soccer in their lives and for what it's provided them. I mean, whether you're, you know, Messi or, you know, a regular Jordan Pelebe or, you know, average person, like a lot of people in this global community want to give back. And, and for us, like, you know, there's, for a lot of us, you know, there's no way to give back than ensuring that kids have the opportunity to play it you know, play, yeah. realize their passion for this game. And, and like that is, again, at the core of what our brand stands for. Um, and, you know, one of the key things that we hope to focus on, and like we're working with some, some awesome, you know, names in the, in the, in the soccer space, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in a conversation with, with you all about, uh, you know, activating the freestyle or, uh, mm -hmm you know, and uh, network uh, around creating safe spaces to play and, um, and you know, activating their audiences. And um, that's where we really are hoping to go is, is to engage a global soccer audience around, uh, you know, ensuring this game to the world. You know, it's, it's, it's a fundamental uh, opportunity for self-expression and, uh, you know, positivity in people's lives. And it's such a platform. The game itself is a platform for everything, you know, health and education and peace. And so how can we, uh, you know, help the global community come together around that mission is, is our ultimate ideal. Love it. Perfect. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of people that want to, to be a part of that. And um, again, I really urge everyone who, who's tuning in to, uh, to reach out, explore what they, what Love Football do. Um, yeah, I think your humility and your humbleness about what you do is, is another one of your biggest assets that I think just is, is obviously it's easy to work with you guys. And, and I think that more people can, uh, can be a part of this journey, the, the better. So wish you every success with it. And for sure, we'll be, we'll be working together throughout. So <laughs> looking forward to that. Um, but no, thank you so much. Thank you for that. And, um, and again, what, you know, for, Further motivation for those watching, you know, this is really about um, your drive and your desire, right? You, you didn't have the resources yourself. You, you, your passion carried it through and inspired others to join the family and to, whether it was donations or, or manpower. Um, and, and it just goes to show that you can build a, a global business within the football industry um, with passion. And, and that's what it comes down to, a belief that the game stands for more. So hats off to you, good sir. <laughs> thank you dan <laughs> together man we can do it you know definitely no thank you thanks again um thank you everyone for watching uh stay safe and remember all you need is a ball thanks dan <laughs>